Thank you for having me here, for having this talk. Um, I'm going to have this talk in English. English is my third language, so French is my second, Dutch is my first. Uh, we'll see what it gives. Um, but I want to present myself first. Um, I'm Antenne, I'm a psychologist. I'm rather feeling a stranger in this uh, society here. But um, I'll, talk, have, I'll have a talk with you about um, extremely obese children. And if yes or no, we could detect certain profiles in them. Uh, we are working together with Caroline Brad from Ghent University. Um, so I'm the field worker and Caroline is a scientist and she's deducting all the studies in our center. Um, yeah. So this is where I work. Um, we are um, Zeepreventorium, the Haan. Uh, it's a... Um, um, a residential and inpatient care center for chronically ill children. So we, tr we have about 180 beds. Uh, 80 of those beds are for children with diabetics, uh, cystic fibrosis, asthma, um, chronic uh, fatigue, and all other chronic illnesses. But about 100 of our beds are for children with extreme <coughs> obesity. So we have a nice center at the coast uh, of Belgium, I didn't uh, give you an image of Ghent University because Ghent University is a building. We have a very nice building at the seaside. So um, when I started, or when we started in 1994, so about 25 years ago, we started with the treatment of uh, extreme obese children and youngsters. And at that time, it was very clear the intake for those youngsters was far more bigger than the expenditure. And there probably was a genetic uh, sensitivity. But I was a psychologist and I was part of the package. So I thought I should be useful too. And we asked ourselves, um, is there also something in psychology? What's the role of environment? What would be the role of some psychological factors? So first of all, perhaps <laughs> about environment. Um, already in 2005, we had this image. There are multiple influences on what children eat. Sociocultural influences, parents, caregivers, individual characteristics, and I would like to highlight some of them, not all of them, because that wouldn't be possible in 15 minutes. But first of all, we have that obesogenic society. Um, I have a little film. I don't know if we could press on the play. So to show you and to be sure, ourselves, how is it possible that some kids become obese and others don't become obese, although we are all living in the same environment? So, as a psychologist, we have an, a, a concept called uh, executive functioning or a reward system. And to give some theoretical um, explanation about that, there are some kids who have system that is driving them to food. It is coming from underneath. It is a bottom-up system. There are also kids who have a very good brain inhibition, a cold system 
coming from upside over here. So that's a top-down system. Now, the advantage for the kids with a top-down system is that they can see the long-term goal. They see that perhaps it would be better to take an apple because next they'll have a cookie or because uh, perhaps they'll become obese, who knows. Those who are thinking rather bottom-up are those who are going for an immediate reward. They see a cookie and they want that cookie, point. They won't think about what is happening after that. So executive functioning and reward is a very important issue. We did some, uh, some tasks in our center, computer tasks, very simple tasks with planes, where they have to push right when the plane goes up, but when the plane goes up on the other side, they don't have to push. A very, very simple task. And we saw that in obese children, our obese children, so it is very important to know that this is a clinical group of obese children. They can't stop. They show less inhibition, they are more impulsive, and they cannot resist food. So we asked ourselves, there are a lot of resemblances with, for example, HDHD. So we went to have a look. Are there brain games? Yes, there are brain games. There are games that can do a certain training of the brain, and they existed already for children with ADHD. So now, together with University of Ghent, we are developing one for obese children too. This game is for the moment in construction and being studied in our center, but it seems for some of the people of our center to be a successful game. Uh, and we already, or the group of Caroline um, also has been um, writing on that one in behavior research and therapy. But there are other individual characteristics. So this was a part of kids that um, in this obesogenic uh, environment are especially external eaters. They see something and they want it. But there are also kids who have a psychological profile rather coming from inside. And we asked ourselves how many subtypes would there be and do some subtypes have a worse outcome than others? We had two studies, one study with 200 children, of which 150 of our center inpatient, only 50 outpatient, and a second study in which we had also children with overweight, but only children from our center. So they had about nine to 10 month uh, treatment, a cognitive behavioral therapist uh, program, and of course, healthy lifestyle. We assessed them pre-treatment, post-treatment, and at follow-up. And we used, and these are important because these can be used by anybody. We used especially the eating disorder examination restraint scale. These are all questionnaires that everybody can use. We used the self-perception um, profile scale uh, for children. And that we used the global self-worth. And we used the child behavior checklist that was fulfilled by parents and a youth self-report checklist internalizing scale fulfilled by children themselves. We used a lot of other variables, but those three were the most important ones, and those three are also the ones that, we will, that will help us subtyping those kids. So, first of all, um, we asked us, is there a group of kids, as in adults, that just show a dietary restraint subtype? So, that these are the kids for which the hypothesis would be, they suffer of overweight, they have a low self-esteem. Together with the social pressure, they'll start dieting. And from dieting, they will break down because you can't continue dieting your whole life. And they'll start binge eating. And so they'll return to overweight. So they are going to yo-yo. Yeah? These kids, the pure dietary restraint kids, were kids a subtype we couldn't detect in our group of children. So that was not detectable. But we had another group, and there was a very vast group, a negative effect subtype. It's a subtype that, because of their negative effect, they are going to have emotional eating, and from the emotional eating, they are going to overeat, and so develop overweight. This was a group we detected. Um, and this group refers to the dual pathway that we found already in 2001 by Stice who says that low self-esteem 
could lead to extreme concerns about weight and shape. And so to dieting, a group we saw less as a subtype only, but we found an effective dysregulation and so emotional eating leading to overeating and obesity. Um, stress um, is, for the moment, a very hot topic, in fact, in the relation to obesity in children. And there are uh, scientific researchers at this moment to explain the link between stress and obesity. Uh, there are two mechanisms. There is emotional eating, and there are also the emotion regulation strategies that seems to be that they, aren't, that, that they are maladaptive. So emotional eating, a definition, a short one, should be eating as a reaction on emotions, positive or negative. But in literature, you also can find that it would be a possibility that it is a maladaptive, uh, the consequence of a maladaptive emotional regulation strategy. So if it is, uh, in Flemish we say, kip of a, the chicken or the egg, uh, that's not clear at this moment. So for the moment, we're trying out a very um, new program, 12-week program, in which we are having a look if emotion regulation strategies are teachable in, kin in children with extreme obesity. For the moment, it's a program we, are we developed for children between 10 and 14 years old, because 14 to 18 years old need another program. Um, this program will end the end of this year and will start a new group in January, so we hope to be writing about that by 2020. Um, and then there is also a third group in which we found no psychological symptoms. So the dietary restraint, a very subtype, very clear and neat, is a group we didn't find. We find a negative effect one, children who are emotional eaters, as well in the first as in the second study, about the half of our, our children are negative effect uh, emotional eaters. We found also a third who had no psychological symptoms, and we found about 22% that had dietary restraint combined with negative effect. So the dietary restraint on its own wasn't detectable, but in combination with negative effect, we found it in one-fifth of our children. And the treatment guidelines, of course, for the three subtimes should be different. Kids with no um, psychological symptoms are best treated with a healthy lifestyle, point. Children who have emotional problems should be helped with coping emotions, and those who have dietary restraint attitudes and emotional eating should be helped for both of the issues. Um, we also looked um, to the uh, follow-up effects, and um, it's clear that kids with no psychological uh, symptoms had better outcomes in the long term. The group with negative effect and the group with dietary restraint and negative effect had the same outcome. So they had a worse outcome, but the same. So it is not because they have dietary restraint combined with negative effect that the result was worse than when they only have negative effect. We also did a community study. Uh, we asked ourselves for kids who don't come to a clinical center as ours and who suffer from overweight, would we also find those three types? And we let them, we have given them the same questionnaires. And we found in this group of community uh, kids that about 14% are also emotional eaters, 56% don't show psychological problems, and about 30% shows dietary restraint and negative effect. And a very important question then is, how comes that those kids in community also suffering from overweight don't look for help? There is something that is protecting them. And I'll come to that later, because we think that there is a combination of factors. Um, and the last thing I just want to highlight is, yes, of course, Obese children display a personality, a specific personality. You can type them. There is a typology uh, feasible for them. But there are also the parents. And one thing I want to highlight about the parents is that we found that there is also an element of insecure attachment. So there's not only the low self-esteem that leads to dieting, 
But there seems also to be insecure attachment in parents that leads to affective dysregulation and leads to emotional eating. For those parents with an insecure attachment, we have a systemic, a systemic uh, therapist, because I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, we have a systemic uh, therapist who is trying to develop also for these parents an intervention that might have effect even without helping the kids. But that's also a big question mark for the moment. So, uh, as take-home messages, messages um, I, uh, as a psychologist, together with a group of uh, Caroline Brad at Ghent University, would very much insist that you all make a psychosocial profile of the child and the family. There are only two, three questionnaires you have to use and to have a look what subtype that would be for this child and then adapt your um, way of looking at it and way of helping the kid because of the... A stepped care uh, approach is very important. If kids don't have psychological problems, healthy lifestyle should be enough. And obesity treatment is necessary for those kids who show negative effect or negative effect with um, dietary restraint. Um, for the future, uh, we're developing so those programs, those treatment programs, for the kids who are especially external eaters and ex executive functioning training, we are developing trainings for the kids who are uh, especially negative effect uh, eaters, emotion regulation training. But perhaps there's also a group of kids who needs both. And perhaps there's also a group of kids in which we just have to help the parents and we don't have to help the kids. There's, so there, there stay a lot of question marks but we're trying to detect all of the subtypes and trying to link each subtype to the right training. So in that way, we are very glad that uh, in August, in fact, the Edmonton Obesity Staging System for Pediatrics has been launched. The Edmund, Edmonton Obesity Staging System existed already a long time for adults, but it didn't exist yet for pediatrics. And the nice thing about this system is that it takes into account more than only BMI. That was a discussion this morning. More than only the, the, the number of the BMI. Okay. So this staging system takes into account medical things, the four Ms. Medical things, metabolic things, mechan mechanical things also. So the, um, the physiotherapists play, uh, play their role. Mental things, so psycho psychopathology, and the milieu, the social elements, are also very important. Social elements are very important, and that's also one of the things we think that is a very big difference between a community study and our clinical study. This, um, we have in our clinical setting about 65% of children out of low social economic status families. So perhaps those who don't look for help are those who have a better social environment. And these stages, we think, uh, would for the future perhaps help us to better categorize and better look which help, which child, and which family should need. Thank you very much. And if you need, if you have questions, please. Thank you, Ben Ice, for the interesting presentation. So we have time for two, three question comments. So uh, maybe I will start. It's uh, very interesting to see that you, you can approach a kind of uh, modelization of uh, the psychological profile, but I was, I'm so surprised to see that your studies show only two main uh, psychological profile, so self the poor self-esteem uh, children, and on the other side, the emotional uh, do you think there is only two main uh, groups of uh, uh, such profiles? Um, oh, no, we're convinced that there are more. But we started with the um, model of Stein's, and that was a, uh, from since 2001 already as a model for uh, adults. So we started with that model, and we are now having a look if there are more than these. But they seem to explain a lot of our problems, psychological problems in our clinical group. So that's why for the moment we're looking for treatment only for those two big groups. Yeah. 
Understand. And can you, can you tell us how you do the categorization in your daily practice? At what point do you categorize them and how is it being done? Oh, yeah. Um, it's a, a, a very nice question. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a convention with our social secu security. And um, up to now, we uh, assessed each child when it already was in our setting. So that was up to now. But as from now, our social security is also asking to assess children before admission. So what we're going to do is we'll see them when they are first um, coming and have a look to our setting. And once they've decided that, yes, we could be a help, a help for them, then we already will start the assessment before they come um, into treatment uh, groups. So for the moment, it was only when they were there and the first six weeks were used in observation time and used to categorize them. And as from 1st of January, we will be obliged to do that before they arrive. And we do it with a, an, an, an online um, an online app in which they uh, can fulfill these uh, questionnaires. So, so, so it will be very interesting to see your serious games when it will uh, be uh, <laughs> available. Yeah, and then Caroline will come and okay. explain that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you again.